Hello. It's still the morning. The coffee hasn't worn off yet. Um, let's not be too pessimistic. We are going to talk a bit about the lack of evidence for some of the things that we do. I'm going to try and be as positive as I can and give you some practical tips where possible. And really, overall, just make a plea for applying some of the skills that you have learned and, and apply yourselves in terms of your clinical practice, applying some of those principles to training and education as well. Let's take an evidence-based approach to education. Now, I am going to ask you to do something. All right? And to, to do that thing, you are going to need to write something down. So if you've got a moment or two, find a pen and paper, or if you've got a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop and you can just jot a few things down. In a, in a few minutes' time, there's no urgent rush, but if you've got it and you can participate in a very short lightning learning activity, that will make some of the points for me. Okay? Uh, while you're doing that, uh, I will tell you that, yes, this, the model that we're going to talk through for our half hour or so together is, in many ways, the model that informs uh, a new MSc in medical education that we've started in the Swansea University Medical School. It's a distance learning program, so it's designed to be flexible, to meet the uh, complex job plans and, and workload demands of the sorts of students who might come onto it. There is a face-to-face -face element once a year, recognizing that learning and teaching is very much a practical skill, and there are some practical skill sessions built into it, but where possible, we've tried to make this distance learning and flexible. So, the starting point for our model, then, is the evidence-based model for clinical practice, evidence-based medicine. And one of the best described and most cited of those is the model that was put forth by Sackett and Co. in 1996. And that basically took three key sources of, of information. The first was to take the best available evidence and to integrate that with the judgment of the clinician and the values and preferences of the patient. And this is a model I'm sure most of you will be very familiar with, but it's worth us refreshing ourselves very briefly because there is a tendency to think about evidence-based medicine as being solely about the evidence. And it isn't. It's about the integration of those three key sources of information. And at the interface of those three things, we have evidence-based practice in medicine. Now, it's quite easy to see this is a decision-making model. Okay, you've got a particular situation in front of you, you're planning for a particular situation. How do I make the best decision for, say, a particular patient or group of patients or, or, or in a particular procedure? Integrate those three sources of information, take an evidence-based approach. Using the best evidence, the best outcomes are going to be uh, attained. What we're really asking for to our group of trainers here is to apply that same principle to education. Right? The talks we've already had this morning show quite clearly that education is really important. Everybody here has had an education and it's probably taken a long time to get in educational terms to where you are. And from our first speaker, we heard that it also costs a lot of money and it's really important. We want our trainees and our, our new graduates to be trained to the best that we can because they are then going to take people's lives in their hands. And so it's important for us to apply these same standards of rigor to education and training as it is to clinical practice. And you can see how if we take this model, quite quickly tweak it into a model of evidence-based practice and education. We would still use the best available evidence. Rather than uh, uh, patient values and preferences, we might consider learner values and preferences. And rather than clinician judgment, we'd be using educator judgment. And there, you can see we're starting to move towards a model of evidence-based practice and education. But, and there are a number of buts, and that's really what the detail of the model is all about, and it's part of the main messages I want to get across to you this morning. Learning and teaching, education and training clearly isn't the same as clinical practices. There, is an, uh, there are a number of differences. And there are a number of differences in the components of this model as well. And from the title of the talk, I think you can see a common theme for navigating our way through some of the differences between evidence-based practice in medicine and evidence-based practice in education is to apply the principles of pragmatism for reasons that will become clear. Uh, if we start at the bottom of our model, then, with learner values and preferences instead of patient values and preferences, in terms of a full model of evidence-based education, I think we have to take a step back from uh, just simply considering learner values and preferences and considering the context in which we're making our decisions about education and training. Do we have access 
to, this, to all the right resources, the venue where teaching and learning is taking place, the resources available to us for assessment and uh, teacher availability, all those sorts of things need to be considered when we're making our evidence-based decisions about how to proceed in education. But really, one of the main differences that I want to work through with you all this morning between evidence-based practice in medicine and education concerns this idea of best evidence. And, and one of the punchlines really is that the types of evidence that you might be used to referring to in your clinical practice are very different when it comes to educational practice. The types of research that's done in learning and teaching, the sorts of standards that are applied and the, and the sort of quality analyses that are done in research and education are different. And that's not to say they're necessarily better or worse, but they're certainly very different. And that's one thing we have to bear in mind when we're considering our sources of best evidence. Now, those of you who know me will know I'm, I'm an optimist uh, by definition, by background. Th that's not actually true. Um, but there are a lot of good things that I can commend to you in terms of the evidence for learning and teaching. There are lots of things that work. There are lots of simple things that demonstrably make a difference to how well our students, our trainees do when we're teaching them, when we're assessing them. To, what we're going to do is, is explain a core principle, a core, basically, neuropsychological principle that underpins a lot of the good evidence for learning and teaching. And in order to do that, I'm going to get you to do a very short <coughs> quiz. Okay, it's not a test, because I'm not allowed to call it a test. It's a quiz, right? Don't be nervous. It's going to be okay. You're going to see a slide for eight seconds, okay? What I want you to do is look at that slide for the eight seconds. It's got a list of words on it. What I want you to do is try and remember, as best you can, all the words that are on that slide, okay? Don't write anything down. It's not under exam conditions, but I will be keeping an eye out. Then there's going to be a blank slide for five seconds. And in those five seconds, I just want you to try and remember what was on the previous slide. And then, after five seconds, I want you to write down all the words that you can remember from the first slide. There's some, some gasping and some sighing. <laughs> it's very, very simple. Does that make sense? All right, here we go. Write as many of them down as you can remember. So we normally have a we have a few seconds of scurrilous writing, and then some people start looking up and think, oh, I'm not from Wales, this isn't fair, and there's other people still furiously writing. It's okay. If you don't do very well, that's okay. All right. Some people are still writing. Most people are looking up. All right. What we're going to do then, before I show you the answers, because I know health professionals are a competitive bunch and you want to see how well you've done, we're going to do exactly the same thing again, first of all, okay, with a different set of words. Right, exactly the same principle. It's going to be up there for eight seconds. Have a look at it. Blank slide for five seconds, and then write down all the ones you can remember. Okay? <laughs> now hold on to that feeling, because that's important. We're going to come back to that right at the end. This bit doesn't normally take quite as long. <laughs> Do we have anybody from Armenia? <laughs> One person. Okay. You might have to just hold your answers down for the purposes of the explanation, okay? All right. So, have a look at them. 
Now, and, and because I am a scientist by background, I will explain that the, the list on the left is the 10 biggest towns and cities in Wales, the 93rd biggest country in the world. The list on the right is the 10 biggest towns and cities in Armenia, the 94th biggest country in the world. Um, the list on the left uh, only applies when Wales are not playing rugby at home, because then the, the Prince Party Stadium comes in at number three. <laughs> From a grammatical and linguistic perspective, these lists are very similar. Okay, they've got basically the same numbers of letters. They've obviously got exactly the same numbers of words, similar numbers of syllables. But I'm going to bet that all of you, possibly bar one, got more from the list on the left than the list on the right. Okay, I told you, it was a very simple test. Now, there's a huge amount in this very short exercise that illustrates what happens in here when we're learning something and what happens when we have learned something and what happens when we're trying to retrieve information. Okay? Let me ask you a couple of questions and don't be shy, okay? Because what I'm asking you is did you get it wrong and if you got it wrong, that's okay because it illustrates the point. First of all, how many of you in this list on the left, when you were trying to remember it and write it down, how many of you got on the M4 at junction 43 in your mind and then... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, some hands going up when you took the little trip down the motorway, or you got on the 628 to London Paddington from Swansea and you remembered the stations, or you had a map in your head, or you thought where the football teams are, or the rugby teams, and so on and so on. Lots of hands going up. Okay? Let me ask you a slightly more complicated question. How many of you, and again, don't be shy, how many of you have on your list that you've written down a Welsh town or city that is not on the list here? Two, three, oh my gosh, lots and lots and lots. <laughs> Anyone like to tell us which, which town and city? Carmarthen. Carmarthen and Bangor are normally two that come up very, very frequently. Okay, lots of people ha have done that. And what that shows us is how we store information right, once it's learned. Okay, it goes into a construct in our long-term memory that where we, when we're learning something new, we stick it alongside something that looks similar. Okay? And what you're trying to... What you're doing then when I'm asking you to recall that list of words is you're not necessarily holding on to it in your, in your working memory, in your active memory. You're reaching into your long-term memory and you're pulling it out. And some bits have got stuck to it that weren't actually there on the initial list. In a simpler definition, then, you have learned that list on the left and most of you have never learned that list on the right. And the third thing that's really important about that list on the left is I'm going to guess most of you have never sat down with the big book of Wales and thought, to my, thought well, I need to know what the 10 biggest towns and cities are in Wales and try to learn it. You haven't deliberately learned it, but you've learned it incidentally, and most of you will have got most of the, the words on that list. Okay, going back to the, to the neuropsychology then, what you're doing with the list on the left is you're reaching into your long-term memory and pulling information out. What you're doing with the, the list on the right is because there is nothing in your long-term memory, unless you are from Armenia or, or are familiar with it, you're trying to actually just use your working memory to hold on to that information. And our working memory, as many of you will know, is hopeless. Right? It has a terrible, tiny, short-term capacity for storing and processing information. Okay, and yet... It is absolutely essential for learning, okay? and, I, and I know I'm talking to a slightly different audience here, so there will be lots of you with a vast experience in different types of memory, and we're not going to get into the detail of those. But from a learning perspective, we can think of memory in three basic forms. In short-term memory, your sensory processing, obviously your sensory systems are processing a huge amount of information in real time. For example, uh, that my, I have a dark-colored tie on. Most of that information is never consciously process. It never enters your working memory until you pay attention to it. And then when you pay attention to it, the information goes into your working memory while you try and work out what to do with it. And eventually, some of that information, through repeated practice, will end up in your long-term memory once it is learned. It's a very simplistic neuropsychological model of how learning happens. A key thing that helps get information into long-term memory is when you're trying to learn it and holding it in working memory is to bring out stuff that looks similar. And what working memory does is it will then look down into long-term memory, pull up things that look similar, stick them onto those, and send it down into long-term memory as learned information. That, those processes, those very simple processes, underpin a great number of techniques that we deploy in learning and teaching that are evidence-based and that, that work. And by work, 
What I mean is students who are taught using those techniques do better than students who are taught using more traditional techniques of standing up in front of a group of people of talking at them. Uh, I'll give you some simple examples. Testing, formative and practice testing is really effective. Reducing the amount of mental effort that working memory has to do during learning so that it doesn't become overloaded. Okay? Your working memory was overloaded simply by having to try and remember those Armenian towns and cities. Yet at the same time, having working memory do a little bit of work, what we call desirable difficulty, does facilitate learning. And there's lots of techniques that derive from that. Having students teach each other within uh, appropriate guidance and boundaries is a very effective way of helping them learn. Spacing out teaching rather than having it in blocks. Using concrete examples that students will be familiar with, that are in their long-term memory, that you can pull out and stick new information onto. And feedback, which we've already heard about, if done properly, is a very powerful uh, teaching technique. And there is a lot more besides which we couldn't possibly cover in the less than 10 minutes that I have remaining. If you want some further sources of information, uh, there's a fantastic collaborative organization called the BEMI, Best Evidence Medical Education Collaboration. There's a link to their uh, website at the end where you will find lots of reviews of evidence for different teaching techniques. Okay, so that's all the positive stuff and all the good stuff. And let me just t tell you very briefly about how some of that is translated into practice. Many of you will have heard the term active learning. It's commonly a buzzword in higher and professional education. It's an often misunderstood technique, yet it is one that works. And here is a meta-analysis of 157 research studies using active learning techniques in STEM teaching, showing that, that students who are taught using active learning methods have higher assessment scores, they're less likely to fail, and very importantly for some of the stuff we heard earlier on, they're less likely to drop out. And when we teach people about active learning on our course, there's some shifting in the chair, and we ask people, what do you think active learning really is, and people tell us it's all about problem-based learning and small groups and interaction. And a lot of that is very good stuff to do, but in this meta-analysis, which is a very well done and rigorous meta-analysis, the top three active learning techniques that we used were as follows. Giving students worksheets, using quizzes, and handing out clickers, like in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and having them answer questions. It's as simple as that. And the core theme to all of those is testing which is a really great way of bringing information out of long-term memory and adding new information to it. Another important point from this implementation, 50% of the studies of those 157 used active learning in large group lecture settings. You don't have to have very sophisticated, complicated learning environments to do evidence-based active learning, although there is a lot to be gained from doing that. Okay, that's lots of good stuff. There is a lot we can do that's evidence-based to uh, improve our learning and teaching. We do have to spend a second, a few seconds, on stuff that doesn't work, and stuff that doesn't work, but yet we are often told that it does, and students expect us to use it because they think that it does as well. Now, we try and focus on the positive. Most of our time has been spent on the positive, but I do want to talk about just one technique that has come up already this morning for reasons that will become clear, and that's learning styles. Okay? And learning styles doesn't mean styles of learning. It doesn't mean individual preferences. It means something very specific. Many of you are going to be familiar with these classifications of learning styles. VARC at the top is probably the most common visual, auditory, read-write, kinesthetic. Kolb's learning style inventory, which obviously annoyed Vermont, who then went on to develop an inventory of learning styles. And there's over 70 of them, and what they do is you give them to students and they fill out a questionnaire about the preferences, and then the, the method involves classifying them and pigeonholing them into one, two, three, four different learning styles. And then the idea is you match teaching to a student's preferred learning style. Now, we haven't got a lot of time, so I'm not going to get into the detail. I'm just going to get straight to the punchline. That doesn't work. All right, and to be very clear, I can ask you, and you can ask me, and we can ask each other, how do you prefer learning? And I can tell you, I've never read an instruction manual in my life. I just plug it in and keep pressing the buttons until it does the thing that I want to. <laughs> and that might classify me as a kinesthetic learner. Others might be classified as visual learners, or concrete reflectors, or abstract, and so on. That's a preference. It is what it is. If, however, my teaching is then matched to that learning style, it doesn't make a difference. I don't learn any better. 
And there's a lot underneath that which we don't have time to get into in detail. But I'll try and sum it up very quickly by saying most of what our students are learning cannot be categorized into three or four very specific forms of information. Right? When you're trying to teach students a practical technique, you can't do it only using auditory or visual methods. There are some types of information, let's say recognizing different types of rash or listening to the heart, that do come in predominantly one form of information. But if you're an auditory learner and you're trying to learn to recognize different types of rash, that is visual information. There's nothing you can do about that. Now, there's no evidence then that matching instruction to learning styles is effective. There was a big review undertaken in 2004. It's 104 pages. It reviews all of the evidence for all of the known learning styles to answer this one question. Should we be using learning styles, brackets, in adult learners? Uh, I'll save you reading the 104 pages by telling you what the punchline is. <laughs> for every single one of the learning styles, there was not sufficient evidence, or evidence that there was, where those specific hy uh, predictive hypotheses were tested, said this doesn't work. Right? And yet, this was in 2004, which, take a deep breath, was 15 years ago. Okay? There's been a whole load of research studies that have been done since then that have asked educators a variation on this question, and a lot of these were in medical education. Is it true that individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style, e.g. auditory, visual, kinesthetic? All right, and I'm going to break one of the fundamental principles of instructional design by showing you a lot of very small font on a graph. And the reason for that is you can see there are over 30 studies here where educators have been asked this question. And in the vast majority of them, the vast majority of the educators think that this is true. They think that matching to learning styles is a good thing. Right? Now, there's one or uh, two studies down at the bottom where we get below 50%, but for the majority, it's 85 90%. And there's a whole load of reasons why this is, but in terms of our pragmatic approach to evidence-based education, we need to be aware of this. Not least because our students, and, and I'm aware of some of the evidence that came up before, from, from focus groups asking students, why do you think you don't do so well in a particular educational setting? And they expect that teaching is matched to their learning style because they've been told it works as well. Um, I'm just going to skip on uh, quickly to this um, slide. ERIC is the Education Research Information Database. It's the sort of the PubMed of education research. And if you go onto that database and you put the phrase learning styles in, you get thousands of research results. And the vast majority of those endorse the use of learning styles as a teaching technique. Now, we're close to the end, and some of you might be thinking, oh, you've just spent a few minutes telling us there's no evidence for learning styles, and the, all the research evidence says that it does work. And therein lies one of the fundamental problems and possibly differences in evidence-based practice in medicine versus education. The vast majority of these research studies about learning styles are based on the premise that matching to learning styles is a good thing. They're not testing learning styles. They're doing things like handing out a questionnaire to a bunch of learners, finding out that 61% of them are kinesthetic learners, and saying we need to make changes to our curriculum to account for this. Right? The, the idea that learning styles are a good thing is taken for granted, and yet they clearly are not. That's the good and the bad. Uh, the final thing just to mention is that there is a huge volume of education research, and lots of it, it's, lots of it is helpful, it's informative, but it's not at the same level that you might be used to. It's not the same level that might be informing, say, nice guidelines for a particular situation. Okay? There's lots of low-level, bottom of Kirkpatrick's hierarchy, how was it for you type research, which is useful and informative for people in a particular setting, but doesn't generalize very well and isn't necessarily useful then in terms of informing that decision-making model. And what that means then is rather than necessarily taking best evidence, which is a very different concept in education to medicine, we might have to think more closely about taking the most useful evidence and apply this principle then of pragmatism. This involves recognizing there's lots of evidence that perhaps isn't um, what we would expect to see in clinical practice. Some of it, to be honest, isn't very good. And then there's some of it which, when we're thinking about what's useful and what's not, might just be different. If I'm trying to figure out how best to help my medical students understand the anatomy of the cranial nerves, there's not going to be a randomized controlled trial of how best to teach medical students to learn about the cranial nerves. All right? 
There might be some randomized control trials of some of the other stuff we've talked about, and they will be useful. But there might also be an ethnographic study of someone in a similar position trying to work out for themselves how best to help students learn about the cranial nerves. I'm almost done, I promise. That, for me, might be useful evidence to help me help best help my medical students. And that's, again, where this idea of pragmatism comes in. This, then, is the, our final current working uh, um, iteration of the model, the most useful evidence combined with educator judgment applied in a particular context is how we currently think the best way to approach evidence-based education. At summary then, evidence-based education is possible and there are lots of people for whom the complexities mean they think it isn't. It is. There's lots of good stuff out there that we can apply and in deciding how best to apply the good evidence, we perhaps need to be more pragmatic than we are in other situations. Um, and if you want to take away just one thing one core principle is that working memory is a rate-limiting step for learning. And the last slide I'm going to show you concerns the use of, of jargon. Okay? We all know what this is, right? Okay, if you don't know what it is, it's probably not a good audience to, to admit that to. <laughs> it's a list of parts of the brain. All right? It's parts of the brain that our medical students have to know about by the end of their studies. You have to be able to stick a pin in them. They have to tell us what happens when they go wrong, tell us what drugs act on them. It's not by no means a comprehensive list of parts of the brain. It's just one I wrote off the top of my head. It's a neuroscience joke. It never works. I should give up on it. It's, a, it's brief. OK, what are some parts of the brain that students need to know about? Now, to me, my background is in neuroscience. And those of you who have a good understanding of neuroscience and neurology, this is going to be second language to you. You're going to be familiar with this. And when you look at this, this is what you're seeing. Okay, this is all familiar to you, right? but your new trainees and your new students, when you put those slides up at the beginning of your teaching session, that's what they see. All right? And that feeling you had when that, those jargon words, words that mean nothing to you came up on the slide, that's how it feels to be overloaded, and in many cases, that's how it feels to be a new trainee or a new medical student. Right, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, there are just some references here if you want some more information about some of the, the stuff we've covered. And I've probably gone a little bit over time, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them if there is availability. Thank you.